Ashley Clipper, Clicker guy. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. What's your name? Wolfgang. Outstanding. Thank you. That was fun too. The, one of the one of the briefings I gave um, down at uh, let's see, it was Air Force IT Cyber Conference in uh, down in Montgomery last summer. They were yes, ma'am. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and so even before it started, have you met Tracy? There, there's, a, there's always a cost for the exit, so maybe this is part of that cost. I don't know. Um, then the, uh, no, anyway, so, so like two minutes before my, my brief starts, she comes up to me. I'm, I'm like at the podium. She's like, do you know if this, uh, if this panel has or this, this uh, briefing is looking at some new credits? I was like, I can't imagine that it would be. She goes, find more. <laughs> well, all right. I am dead to you. I usually I go like almost every, almost everyone falls. And remember how I said this is this is a this is a friendly crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Those ones you can't count on being friendly. Yeah. <laughs> when was he on a report card? Like, yes, this system is actually my favorite. Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Yes. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Colonel Greg Griffin. I'm the, I am uh, the DIS's chief of defensive cyber operations. I almost stumbled in my last title there. So I, I, I've done my, my my previous job in front of audiences like this a number of times. This is the first time as as the DCO chief I've done that. So I, I apologize for for stumbling there initially. So today we want to talk to you about the challenges we have uh, facing DISA in, in doing DCO and DISA and also at, at, as, a, as a CSSP provider for a significant number of, of agencies and organizations out there. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick overview and, and mission and scope and I'll pass it on to operations, then to plans and policy, finally to CSSP and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up very 
very uh, quickly, but we're going to leave a lot of, lot of uh, room at the end for some questions. Uh, so I'm joined today by Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jim LaCavera, who is uh, my uh, operations chief. Uh, also with Robert Mowinney, who is my plans policy and future ops. And then also, uh, finally, uh, uh, Daryl Fountain, who's my CSSP chief. So without further ado, hold on. All right. Of course, technical difficulties for DISA. That's awesome. Okay. So uh, getting to uh, uh, overall uh, mission and scope. So um, say a fairly straightforward DCO mission, you know, a plan, synchronize, organize, direct, uh, the security and defense of the DISN. So um, the smaller network, not the, the, the entire DODEN, but I'll get into that later. But but really it's the coordination of the various elements that DISA has. That's what makes it hard. Um, it's not that we have such a broad uh, space, but it's, we have a number of different organizations out there that are operating uh, within our space that need to be synchronized interactions. Uh, from, from the different theaters, you know, DISA PAC and DISA Global and DISA uh, Europe, uh, but also to other entities uh, within DISA who are executing defense, synchronizing all of those together has been, is, is a challenge, and that's the mission of CE2 and the team that I lead uh, and the, the different branches that I have assembled here. Uh, that is the, the, their focus together. Moving down to the vision, um, really focusing on standardization across the environment and, and across those three different entities. So moving forward, uh, enable that global standardization of enterprise cyber defense. That is really the key for us uh, and where we're launching uh, forward. We are moving also to a more data-centric approach uh, as, as I, I think we have, we have found throughout the industry that that is uh, the prevailing direction we're moving. But standardizing across all of those elements is, is key in moving forward and actually getting out of playing kids soccer and getting up to playing uh, uh, pro ball uh, against the folks that we are, we are currently uh, see as our adversaries out there. Um, so to, uh, to get after the environment, no, <laughs> thank you. To get after the environment, as, as many, many of you have probably seen this graphic before, want to emphasize the, the, the role of CE2 and the, and the group that I lead, the, 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 the DISS's Defensive Cyber Op Operations Director versus DODEN's role, so our Joint Force Headquarters DODEN's role. So the, my team is responsible for all of DISS's assets and DISS's terrain, which does include that, that internet boundary, the IAP boundary between the internet and, and NipperNet. However, we do not have span of, of control or influence or really anything over the services and other agencies that are out there that do operate. That is, that is the role of Joint Force Headquarters Doden, and, and we, just like the other services and agencies, take our direction from them. So when we talk about synchronizing the bigger fight, that is Joint Force Headquarters Doden's role and not necessarily ours. We do play a, 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 a significant and unique role based on the uh, different from our peers uh, at that structure because of some of the terrain that we control that is, uh, I would say, department critical uh, as opposed to service or agency level critical. Um, so with that, uh, I want to transition over to uh, Colonel Lacavara, uh, who will talk to you about um, operations. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Lacavara. I'm the Chief of Current Operations and this is Defensive Cyber Operations Division. And I'm just going to talk to you first about um, sort of how DCO is organized in DISA. So uh, moving from left to right, we have several, we have operation centers on a global scale. So our, our global operation center is at Scott Air Force Base outside St. Louis, DISA Global. And uh, they have a team of real-time analysts. They're handling what would be considered incident response. Um, they're they're um, monitoring our defensive cyber operations tools real-time. Um, they're the ones that are processing alerts, turning them into tickets, res uh, trying to vet them and uh, respond to real incidents that are occurring on our network. Uh, we also have some operations center, uh, smaller ones, pushed further forward in Europe and uh, in the Pacific. 
um, and they're doing uh, similar, similar missions just a little bit further towards the, the edge of supporting those combatant commands. Uh, then you have our division. Uh, we work up in DISA headquarters, and we have uh, three branches. Uh, my branch, operations, um, is concerned with essentially directing and prioritizing all of our DCO efforts within the agency and um, just providing C2 um, over the myriad things that are going on. We also process threat intelligence um, and disseminate that to the field. Then uh, Rob's uh, branch plans requirements and transformation is looking a little further ahead uh, than I am uh, for uh, things that DISA can bring in to, to make uh, my team's job easier and more effective, and he'll talk to you about that. And then our third branch, CSSP Services, uh, Daryl will speak to you, uh, is, is the uh, managed subscriber um, services um, with service level agreements and such. So just to dive a little bit deeper into my world, um, so we have several important defensive cyber operation missions that we perform for uh, DOD. Um, and, and, and the way I look at it, so I spent most of my career in IT service delivery, um, and DCO is, is different. It's just a different animal because IT service delivery is really focused on break fix, um, you know, and, and, and ways you can, you know, you, you can get proactive and try to pr uh, prevent, prevent things from, from breaking. But DCO is different because it's actually a fight. It's a fight against a thinking adversary, an adversary that is um, adaptive and moves and changes um, and that just requires a bit of a different mindset. Um, to, in my opinion, a less administrative mindset. And even though we need, to, we, we, we really do need processes, um, we also need processes that support a fight against the thinking and, and adaptive adversary. So um, just some of the missions that we perform, we, we defend the perimeter of the DISN. So for um, uh, uh, Nippernet and, and, and Cipernet. So um, our perimeter defenses need to make sure that the traffic flowing from the DOD, the DISN, to and from the internet is secure. All right, and that's a, a big challenge. I would just say that um, we, we have massive amounts of data flowing each day, and therefore our tools are generating massive amounts of data and alarms. So just for context and scoping, um, about 10 million alarms a day is what our tools are throwing throwing out, uh, that's logs, logs and alarms, uh, log alerts, uh, uh, and alerts that are presented to the, to the analyst. Um, 800 million events are being logged. Um, our tools are blocking about 300 million um, uh, malicious a uh, actions a day, and uh, maybe over 10 million emails um, that, are, that are being blocked as well. So, so we're doing this at scale, right? So, and I, and I, and I won't dive into it because I think Rob will be, but I think it's, it's clear to say humans can't keep up with this type of scale, right? So we need, not only do we need tools to help, um, but we need tools to actually end up doing some of the work for us. Otherwise, some of that work is just sort of falling on the floor, all right? And we're just trying to, to, to triage as best we can. Um, at the perimeter, we're um, actively interested in defending against adver adversary reconnaissance of our networks. So we want to, we're looking for actions we can take to, to deny the adversary visibility into what our networks look like and where they may be vulnerable. Um, we're also defending the availability of the DISN. So against uh, attacks like denial of service attacks, um, we need to protect the availability of DNS um, if that goes down. So does the availability of um, some critical services. Uh, and, and we're also trying to interdict attacks that are passing through. Again, we're at the perimeter, so attacks that are um, directed at endpoints. Um, we're trying to knock down as many of those as we can to make the job a little bit more manageable for the endpoint and the alerts that are happening on the endpoint um, to be uh, effectively actioned by our, our analysts at that level. So that's what we're doing at the endpoint. Uh, DISA also is a major service provider. So um, uh, huge services provided to the DOD and we, we also have a mission to defend those. So email, enterprise email is one. We need to be uh, effectively defending against phishing, which is um, 
one of the most uh, widely used uh, cyber attacks to get a foothold or a beachhead into a, into a network. Um, and, and when we deliver the email service to DOD we, uh, customers, we need to make sure that we're, we're, um, we're defending that avenue of approach for them. Same with VoIP, right? Even something like VoIP, if it's, uh, you know, there's an expectation we're delivering a secure, um, you know, to some extent a, a secure service, even on the un unclassed side, right? So we need to defend against those avenues of attack. Uh, we also, thirdly, we need to defend our own area of operation. So DISA itself, we need to defend ourselves um, from attack and compromise. And then uh, Daryl also is, is working to defend our customers, our CSSP subscribers who pay us to provide defensive services. So um, these are sort of four broad areas that we're um, operating in and, and um, our, our division at the headquarters is trying to pull all these things together. Um, Overall, we, we want to get ahead of incident response. So um, yeah, a, way to, par, par, a part of life for defensive cyber operations is going to be responding to things that, that happen, have already happened on our network. A lot of what my team is interested in is to be able to look at what's happening on the network and look at the body of threat intelligence, either open source or um, classified intelligence, and marry those two things together to create mitigation plans. And we want to do this m a mitigation plan deeper than just patching, right? So, so patching is one part of mitigation, but uh, a particular adversary tactic might require more than a patch. It could require, um, you know, a series of actions working together, things at the firewall, alerts put in place, correct signatures put into um, intrusion detection systems so our analysts can see if this activity is in fact occurring. So um, all these things might need to, to come together and, and, and we need better ways to, we're looking for better ways to help synchronize those efforts. Um, some of the challenges and opportunities that we're facing right now, uh, certainly as there is a drive to, to encrypt the traffic uh, going through our networks, and this is going to s safeguard it in transit, but since we use a defense in depth model, right, that creates, that poses additional challenges and strains for defense at the perimeter and, and network defense at, at the, the midpoint it's as more traffic becomes encrypted. So it's sort of driving um, DCO towards the endpoint. And, you know, and, and our defense in depth model will need to, to evolve to, um, you know, as as that trend continues. Um, yeah, I would just say there's other interesting opportunities related to cloud. Uh, we're looking for ways to, um, to get, to push threats further away from the actual systems we're operating on, maybe through virtualization. So technologies like cloud-based internet isolation where maybe we can do our web browsing out in the cloud in a virtualized um, machines that stand up and tear down, um, you know, for the user and any threats they might encounter out there are were contained in with that environment. They didn't, they never touched our DoD networks, um, and therefore, not only are we saving bandwidth, not only are we, are we pushing, the, keeping the threats out of our network, but we're also that's just even more data that we never needed to collect um, and and push to the real time analysts. So, uh, so these are these are some of the things that that I'm concerned about on a daily basis and um, kind of where we're at now. And Rob, um, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some things we're doing to make our life easier here in current operations. Yeah. Well, okay, so Rob Mulwaney, uh, Future Ops and DCO. We, as Jim, as Jim relayed um, or tried to articulate, the, the push and the involvement of DCO and how we do cyber is pushing us and trending us more towards how do we defend data. Um, in the past, we've done a lot of mid-tier networking type of defense and layering in those pieces. We've got a hard outer crust. I would, I would say we, like many companies, we're like an Oreo, nice and hard on the outside, nice and squishy on the inside. Um, so as we're evolving and as we're trying to, to figure out how does this, this work and go forward, um, it, everything is pushing us more towards um, the involvement of, of everything cyber is pushing us more towards the data. Uh, everything in the mid-tier is getting encrypted, which is good. So that's, that's good. That's positive. 
it, it's really hard for the defenders, though, if that's where we're focused. So, so that focus area is starting to trend a little bit more towards the endpoints um, as we go forward. To get there, though, um, and this is where, thank God I'm not Jim and I don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day stuff, and I've, you know, I get to work, look out a little bit further. One of the challenges we've had, and this is not a new challenge, is data tagging, right? So I can't get to some of these evolutionary pieces of, of technology that are coming out there if we can't figure out how to, how to work towards data tagging um, and getting some proper tags in there so that we can actually start to do analysis and analytics against some of those common, common threads. Um, so data tagging is becoming a huge issue for us within the department. Uh, the automation and the auto mitigation, we really, I mean, you can read into that and say machine learning and AI. Um, I would challenge, I can't really get to AI until I get the data tagging piece in place. Um, the machine learning is, is more automated, but we're really looking for, at the end of the day, we can't people our way out of this. I mean, that's, that's where we're at. Um, the budget's not there for us to produce that anymore. So we've got to figure out some other ways to get people's faces out of, you know, Jim's talking about all this, all that data that's coming across the screens. Well, somebody's looking at all that data. Um, and they've got to log into multiple machines to do that. So how do we get them to really focus on the no kidding clean packet? And when I say that, what, what's coming through that really makes sense and they really need to dig into instead of trying to just decipher all the zeros and ones that go, that fly by them on a daily basis and trying to figure out which one of those is the, is the one I'm going to pick and choose to go after and try to defend. Um, so we've got to get our, we've got to figure out a way to automate some of this stuff and get it out of the analyst hands, get them more focused on analyzing and not, not as focused on just looking at the zeros and ones and trying to cherry pick the ones that, that make the most sense to them or, or look the oddest to them out of, out of a whole day's worth, worth of work. Um, securing the cloud. So securing cloud is a big deal right now s as we're, as we're moving forward. Um, that is the way the department is evolving. That is, that's where, that's, that's where everything is heading, right? And I mean on both the unclassed side and the classified side. So um, the cloud technology is awesome, but we've got to figure out a way to defend that data, that DOD data in those environments. Um, and how to pull that back, when to pull that back, what is the right thing to pull back, um, and then how to look at the data. And it all comes back down to the data again as to how, what, what exactly do we need to look at and how do we defend those pieces. Um, and we've got some thoughts and ideas on that going forward. Um, and again, I would, I would say the, the DOD is in their infancy when it comes to cloud, um, and we're trying to push those pieces into more of that, that hybrid nature that's, that's really happening in the commercial world as we move forward. Um, strategy, you'll see, you know, the, a, a lot of these words on here you're going to look at and be like, well, that's, those, those are nice coins, but what do they really mean? So optimizing the operational environment, what, what, what exactly does that mean? To us, that means that as we, as we go out and as these new technologies come in, there's got to be something built in the front end to say, hey, this is, this is your new technology, and this is how you're going to be able to utilize that for defense. Um, right now, that's, that's, that's kind of an afterthought, um, as it has been in, in the world previously, but but it's becoming more and more evident that we need to figure out how to defend in the front end um, and, and identify those pieces, put those into strategies, uh, let, the, let the operators know how to, how to do those defense pieces before it actually hits the street. So that's, that's where we're focused, that's what we're really working on. Um, I've already talked about the data. The software-defined environment, um, if you haven't heard any discussions on that yet, that is, that is another piece of how we're moving forward. There's a lot of changing technology, a lot of changing ar architecture out there. Um, new, new capabilities that are coming around on a daily basis. Software defined environment, zero trust networking. I mean, you hear all these, all, all these new common, you know, big coin fa phrases. At the end of the day, it really means the same thing, is that we've got to figure out how do we utilize those new capabilities and technologies, because they're good, and they're good for operators, they're good for users. How do we utilize those in a better way to defend, um, defend the data? And when it comes to defending the data, there's nobody better to talk to that then Mr. Daryl Fountain. <laughs> Great. Well, all I want to do is know, I don't know who's got a soft middle, but this one's rock hard. Rock hard abs here, okay? So, at any rate. i soft middle. All right. Um, <laughs> maybe. No. Um, so, adapting to the, to the environment. Um, security business is, is hard business and getting harder uh, every day um, and because of the things the themes that you hear here between endpoints and and cloud um, the agency is working hard to expand its service portfolio in concert with that that change in environment um, this stuff again is, is hard harder than woodpecker lips 
to figure out how to come up with a new service because the cloud disrupts our paradigm at the very core. At the very core, it disrupts our paradigm. The data elements that were important to me yesterday are no longer as important to me tomorrow in a cloud environment. The kinds and types of nefarious activity I was looking for before are no longer important to me. So there's some real discovery learning it involved here. And part of that discovery learning drives me to the endpoint. Because as Mr. Mawini said, with the continued proliferation of cheap, ubiquitous, strong encryption, life at the network layer is getting really hard. There are things that can be done there, but it, it's hard business. So we have to learn to drive to the endpoint, collaborate more with our mission partners to secure the data out of those endpoints that can really build an end-to-end -end picture. And then, of course, the, the cloud. The cloud's up, it's down, it, it's, as a, it's a service paradigm. Uh, that's not something that, that our service paradigm, as it's constructed today, is really prepared to deal with. Um, the agency has, has been evolving in this area along with people as they move to the cloud, and we think uh, we're headed in the right direction with that. So how, how are we doing that? Um, our first charge is to stay engaged with the combatant commands, because as a combat support agency, they are our bread and butter. They are the guys that we exist to support. And we understand we have a second center of gravity in the, in the natural capital region, and we have that complex to keep up and to support, but those are two, two different significant areas that, that we have to support. So we stay engaged with them uh, and meet with them all the time. Um, now, as we move to a world where we have automated analytics and, and the nirvana of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence gets ever closer, um, I'm the guy who has to live through today to get to tomorrow. You know, so I'm doing stuff right, right now today uh, for your organizations in, in many cases. Uh, in order for me to do that, I gotta do the bestest with what I got. Um, so we're focused hard on creating a collaborative environment where I can bring the intellectual capital that I have to bear across the agency, spread all around the globe, to bear on problems. I'm looking for creative ways to optimize the enterprise effect that I can bring to bear on a mission partner's problem. Again, I have 180 plus RTAs spread around the globe in all time zones that I can bring to bear on a mission partner's problem whenever I need to. I'm looking for ways to optimize that. I'm looking to create a efficient, effective environment for those 180 analysts to work in. So they can all work together, again, to optimize what they bring that, that our adversary doesn't necessarily bring. Um, the adversary's in a small dark room someplace on the other side of the globe trying to penetrate my defenses all on his own, whereas I've got the enterprise I can bring to bear on his problem. It's, it's a competitive advantage that, that we think the agency has. Uh, and then finally, that team needs, needs the right data element. We talked a little bit about going to the cloud, the data that was important to me yesterday, perhaps not so much tomorrow. The key is working and finding creative systems in partnership with industry to get the right data elements in the right place. A, I have to have the right stuff. B, I have to be able to sift through those large amounts of data in creative ways to find things that, that I wasn't necessarily looking for yesterday. Um, you know, all the stupid cyber criminals they're all caught at the boundary. It's the hard guys that get past that, that you're trying to ferret out, that are really difficult. And that's where we need industry to continue to help us with tactics, techniques, and procedures to make the most out of what we have. Um, and really get after uh, that data. We need your help to move my cyber analysts up the defensive value chain. We need to stop doing hand jamming stuff and sifting through data and move up to the intuitive space that machine can't necessarily do just quite yet. That's where we need help from industry. Um, we're doing a lot of things where we can to optimize our environment today, but that's where we can use help as, as we continue to evolve uh, in the future. And with that, I'll hand back off to the Colonel. Okay, so where, what do we need for, in a nutshell, what do we need from you based on all of what we've just, what we've just uh, talked about? So 
tell us what you're doing. Based on, on, on the, what we've just kind of laid out for you and, and the, the areas and how we've broken up the problem, tell us what you're doing. Tell us what your other customers are doing to be successful in this area. Uh, we know we have not solved the problem, and so we need help. Understand, uh, understanding the alternate ways in which to solve the problem uh, and, and to get after it better. Uh, key par partnerships is the key to our success, 100%. So you can talk to us about new technology. You can talk to us about, uh, about uh, being someone that, 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 that breaks into um, the, R, the ecosystem of, of products that we already have out there. And that's one kind of a conversation. But another kind of a conversation is we already have your product in our, in our vast repertoire of products that we use. How do we use that product better? How do we bring it to its full potential? How can we get some of your experts on board for hours, days, whatever it is, to be able to produce an effect better? Come talk to us about that. Some things we're working on because that's what we know. There's some, some portions of it that I don't think we have any clue about that you could help highlight for us. And then finally, the, for us, for me, as we've mentioned a couple times, I think each one of them hit it, we've got to get to more automation. We've got to get to our, our, our lower level alarms and alerts need to be able to be handled much more uh, uh, quickly and easily uh, that is being dished out by an automated adversary. They need to be handled in an automated fashion, or at least more, uh, more of how they are handled needs to be dealt with in an automated fashion so that at the, there is not the information gathering that's being done by the analyst. He's just doing the synthesis at the, at the end and raising, at the, the, uh, Daryl used a, a very good term at the, at the end, get them get out of, and I don't remember, what was the term you used? Move them up the value chain. Move them up the value chain. And we do that through, uh, through that automation piece. But the precursor to that is standardization and understanding standardized workflow. So if your products deal with that or, and your customers have experienced success with that, we'd love to talk to you about that. So hopefully this discussion that we've had so far uh, has set the stage for you all to ask us some questions and you know really who to direct them at. Um, and it be it either, either operations and, and incident handling um, uh, in the, in the real-time fashion, uh, more the plant's policy and, and, and future operations of, of, uh, of uh, Rob and, and Daryl's group at the end uh, with, with CSSP and how we're providing service to others, particularly those in the cloud. So I appreciate your time that, you, that you've, uh, you've uh, uh, shared with us, and we're opening it up to questions at this point. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Rob Anderson from IBM. I'm a retired Marine communicator who focused on communications C2. So I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Uh, a question for you. The C2 that you're using within the, the like Disapac, Disalant, the ones that are supporting the COCOMs, are you guys aggregating all the data from those socks and knocks up to your command element? So I'll, I'll take first whack, whack at that, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let Rob get in there. So so some of that data, yes, is it that the IAP data, uh -huh. that is aggregated. Uh -huh. However, there are some sensor suites that are out in, in Oconus that do keep that data together uh, in an in isolated, um, isolated is the wrong word, but in a, in a separate pool. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, we are working towards being able to have all of that go into one larger pool so for better analytics and better uh, better ability to, to assess and respond to incidents. However, Rob? Yeah, I'd say the, essentially, yes, we're, we're, that, is, that is the direction that we're all going, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you hear the data lakes, the data, you know, the, the BDPs, the Acropolis, all that, all that good stuff, right? Um, we're, we're driving that direction and the bottom line is, all the data needs to be available in one location. It's mm -hmm. going to be utilized multiple ways, and that's the challenge, is that multiple people are going to use it multiple ways. That's the C2 channel. When you talk C2, to me, that's where 
where can I turn on, on and off the switch, which is different than analyzing the data and making sure it's all available in one, one location. So we have the capabilities throughout the entirety of the stack. That's why well, a lot of people talk about maybe we don't need to do as much defense on the perimeter. That's our C2 channel. That's where we actually do the C2 pieces of that. Um, that's our on-off switch for the customers, right? Um, we, so of course, we can do that down to lower layers as well. Um, but, but when I'm talking C2, I, I'm really talking about how, how do I direct and, and take action um, for those customers. Got it. Um, the, the data itself, though, is shared you know, amongst other people. There, there, is, there are some pools of data that we don't for various reasons, um, but, but the idea is that we're all going to be looking at the same data for different reasons. So, so a as you aggregate this and, and you're looking at from a, C to a command and control perspective of these alerts, um, is it clear that I understand you're having a problem I executing trend analysis from all the data that you're aggregating? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a that's a fair assumption. Yes, yes. I mean, it's a lot of data. I mean, you heard you heard Jim. Yeah, it's go through yeah, the 800 million. Yeah, what was it yeah. alerts? Event, events. Events. Al yeah. Which is essentially a logger and alert. Yeah, right. with without data tagging, right? And that goes right. back to the, the data tagging issue. If it was tagged, I could probably trend it pretty easily, right? Um, but but it's not tagged, so therefore all the data looks like data, and I just gotta I gotta sift through it until I can figure out exactly what it is. Um, and I say I, but all these analysts that that Daryl has out there in the field, that's that's what they're doing. They're sifting through all that data yeah. to try to make sense of it because there's no tagging. It's all in one pool. It all looks the same until you start really tearing it apart. And that's what's that's what we need help with the automation piece of it, though, is to, to get to that that evolution. So is it a safe assumption you're using multiple SIEMs to aggregate this data? Okay, so you've got multiple SIEMs are aggregating the data, but you don't have a common platform that can identify, that can literally read all this data in order to execute a standardized format that can then prevent trends analysis and le leverage cognitive computing. Did, did, I, did I sum that up? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that's about right. I mean, you got to remember that the challenge that people face, and I say people, the the any of the vendors are facing right now is the amount of data that the DoD deals with. Mm -hmm. Right, it doesn't scale well for for a lot of companies. So while they can do a lot of good stuff, really good stuff for even some large companies, it still doesn't scale to the to the amount of data they're going to have to deal with across the globe. You know, and sometimes from from places that you wouldn't expect to have latency, like sure. ships and stuff like that, yep. right? So, so it's it's a challenge. That's the challenge. So yes, getting that all to aggregate into one portal, one vi visualization tool is a challenge. Yes. Okay. And then and then from an analyst perspective, the fact that you're having a problem aggregating this data and identifying trend analysis your analysts really aren't able to focus on what could be an indicator that's occurring in multiple places within the environment, correct? That's that's true. To, to compound the issue, maybe, maybe Daryl can talk to this too, but to compound the issue, they don't do it from one screen, right? They do it from 30-something screens yeah, that yeah, they yeah. have to log into. And you can imagine as I'm logging into one to try to figure out, hey, this is what's going on with this, and then I log into the next tool yeah. to try to figure that out, and I log into the next tool. By the time I get through all 37 and come back around to one, the data is either gone yeah. or it's changed. So I'm starting all over again. So I'm in a do loop, right? So automating some of those pieces to get the analyst to, no kidding, I mean, grab all that data, automate all that data into meaning something for me so mm -hmm. that I know exactly what it is and where I need to go look for more, for more information mm -hmm. instead of guessing on a daily basis. Is, I think that's I would, a Yeah, and I, I would just add, so not only is DISA have um, DCO elements glob globally dispersed, yep. but they're, they're globally dispersed and they're sort of functionally focused too. So, okay, I got a, we got teams out here looking at like maybe endpoint stuff. And then I got, then we got a team in another mm -hmm. location that's like looking at email stuff. And then somebody's looking at DNS stuff, right? And, and where I'm struggling is I, I know I need to get all these groups doing great things and their s little center of excellence into one integrated team that's fighting the same fight because right. what you're looking at in DNS is yep. it needs the email people need to know about it because there's a there's there's a relationship potentially absolutely right so how do I so how do you get all this into one we're all in the same environment and not 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 um, so at the right. same weekly meeting sure you know? so is is it a safe assumption then 
that based upon the problems you're experiencing between the deployed command elements, the disappa I don't know what you guys call them anymore, disappack, disalliant, the, it's your subordinate commands that support DCO, right? Um, if you're having a problem aggregating that data and executing um, trend analysis, is it a fair assessment or assumption to make that de JFHQ, Doden, and Cybercom have the same issues with the departments? Yeah, it's multiplied, right? Yes. No doubt. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I'm tracking. Yeah. Yep. Because I, I, I think I got it. Yeah. It, it, okay. I was going to say, it, it, it's multiplied because we only look at the Dizen, the Nipper, yeah, yeah, zipper, yeah. right? Yeah. They look at the whole thing. So just like Colonel had explained in front. And then there's multiple so tool sets that are providing the, the log files and the data. Oh, yeah. That, that really, <laughs> truly aren't being aggregated in... Um, analyze to provide a standardized format yeah, right. you literally, because you've got multiple title 10 monies right, right. that are supporting everything right yep. and everyone knows they're the best yeah so getting well, them to move to something else that's joint that's not theirs we don't thankfully that's not our job yeah i know i'm a <laughs> jarhead man i got <laughs> right. it right that's i mean joy voce course dude has has to tackle that bear yeah but we've got our own challenges just even within the agency about, okay, how do we bring these, 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 these smaller centers, centers of excellence to bring their uh, various uh, processes together yeah. and pick the best of breed and getting them to communicate to one another uh, to be able to do that uh, is sometimes challenging, uh, not because of not a will to do so, but having a the time to do so because as it is, they're already have has a full plate of just dealing with the with the pace of alarms that they have. It, one final question. I, I know I'm hogging the floor. <laughs> Sorry. Um, are, are you guys familiar or working with any uh, the uh, proof of concept that we've got going on with this of your right now? Yes. Okay. So you're on board with it. Oh yeah. Are you showing any success at all with that? Yes. Okay. Problem is scale. Then you don't need to talk to me. Right. <laughs> Uh, no, well, but uh, we do. The, the, the problem is scale. Got it. So we've demonstrated, yeah, for that pocket that they have out there, yeah. they're doing an outstanding job. So really, really, I, I guess I'll talk to you guys offline sure. about sure. finding an engineer. And Okay, yep. thanks. Sorry, everybody. That's all right. It's been entertaining. So uh, I'm Tom Brazil from ICS. Uh, this morning I went to the Kokori briefing, so uh, CCORI, and we learned that there were already 10 – CCORIs done by JFHQ Doden and four by the Navy. So my question is, is there a part of the Kokori process that takes the lessons learned, builds up the body of knowledge from the Kokoris and feeds it back into the CC CSSPs to make sure that, you know, we better defend the Doden? Is there a process involved in that? Yeah. Daryl? Yeah, so. Yeah. I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a feedback loop, so the results of those come back into JFHQ Doden as the, as the uh, OPR for that, um, and feed that back out to the community. There's a number of forums. The DOD CIO work group is a forum that collaborates explicitly to share technical tactics, techniques and procedures, and best practices uh, across the department to, to figure out how we can do things better. Um, that's institutionalized. It happens twice uh, a year. Um, and some some sessions are better than others, but there is a process there to to feed back in to allow people to improve. Thank you. Yeah, to to add to that, so the the CCRIs of the past and the C, C, CSSP inspections, they were lined up so that you do a C, CCRI for a customer that belonged to one of the CS, CSSPs, so that they had a body of evidence when they did the inspection to find out hey. Is there something going on with the CSSP or should there be better communication? So then they went to, went to go inspect the CSSP, they could tell them, hey, this is kind of what we found. Do you have anything to, to help us to understand how this came to be type of thing? So, so they're, they're linked. Sean Paul from the uh, Army Regional Cyber Center at uh, Fort Huachuca. Um, not gonna allow IBM to monopolize all the time. I got several questions myself. <laughs> uh, so made a comment, sir, about the DCO being a fight against an active uh, adversary, and it was a really good point, but uh, how do you balance rules and TTPs and still remain agile enough to continue to uh, combat 
at an adversary that's reacting to your reactions. Right. Um, so uh, definitely need to stay uh, ahead uh, with and, and reacting, developing new TTPs for each particular threat as it comes about. I would say on top of that, though, there, there, can, there is standardized processes that help those TTPs, A, be, be um, shared um, and a process for that. TTPs for how to, how to, how to um, operate at the reporting level that, that is not driven by the, the enemy's uh, uh, actions moving, uh, moving forward, but things that are, are deal with our internal DCO process that allow us to be more effective and more efficient and allow us to, to operate in a much more uh, predictable way with a much more operate internally in a much more pr predictable way to have a, a predictable outcome to when an analyst says, hey, you know what, I get this, 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 al this alert that's firing uh, poorly, it's, you know, it's a high false positive rate or it's got the wrong criticality, how do I very quickly open up a ticket back to my, my boundary team to get that thing tuned quickly? Uh, because of just the sheer volume of alerts that they're dealing with, if we don't provide them with a process that they can that they can finish in less than 30 seconds, we're just killing them. And so that's the kind of t where I'm talking about. That's the starting point for process of process standardization. Um, and then as we get into some of the more uh, in we're talking about automated workflow and getting rid of th some of the alarms, that's where I'm talking about those those alarms that have been persistent for long periods of time. Um, from, from attacks that have been persistent, if not necessarily effective, but create a lot of noise for us, how do we go ahead and get, get, get those dealt with in an automated fashion to either just clear them out or uh, potentially ha have some, some feature on the network turned on or turned off or some sort of thing uh, uh, toggled uh, that allows us to, to not, for something routine that really a, a, a day one analyst can handle, because I don't need our day, you know, our, our three-year, four-year experienced analyst handling something that a day one analyst can handle. Does that answer your question? A actually, that does, and it leads me right into my next one, which is about the SOAR. Uh, so the um, security orchestration automation response, uh, so identifying something down at the lower end, uh, the service tier, whether it's our legacy networks or the JRSS uh, moving forward, uh, our, what are the possibilities of injecting some of the SOAR processes at the IAP. So you have that, you know, low level thing that we, you know, low hanging fruit. How do we get that moved up from the JRSS or the, or the service level up to the IAP to provide the protection upstream? That's exactly my target. Getting after a SOAR to, to, so we can get that noise out on the machine and, and get it so that our, our analysts don't have to deal with that. And they, they are, they are analysts are actually the, the story I've been using or the analogy I've been using with, with, with my folks as I, as I, as I have been uh, wandering through their, their areas is um, that I want the analysts doing what they thought they were going to be doing when they got hired. <laughs> the, all the sexy stuff were like, hey, I, I got to open this case management. I'm going to pursue this thing for a couple hours and I'm going to have like a real impact as opposed to well, I've got to deal with this same alert that I deal, dealt with over the, yesterday, you know, 30 times, and the day before that, 30 times, and the day before that, and just, you know, a Groundhog Day for them. Yeah. I want them to be able to not have to worry about Groundhog Day and want them to be able to do the things that they really thought they were going to be doing when they got hired. And so we can have a, a lower turnover rate, a higher, higher level of, of, of actual engagement on the net. Outstanding. Get rid of the copy pasta. <laughs> the what? The copy pasta. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, also part of that, right? So, the DDoS protection that we get out of the uh, the IAP is actually fantastic. Uh, a lot of people don't really seem to realize that there is some protections provided up there, but it, it is fantastic. Now, note that the Army just said thank you to DISA. I didn't say that. I'm retiring. <laughs> I'm retiring. <laughs> that, hey, I'll have, take it. I may have implied it. You certainly inferred it. I didn't say it. <laughs> oh, come on. So, so the inverse of that, though. So many to one is really good. The inverse of that is not so good, and that's it's the space that we need to work on. So, like market research scanning that happens, where you have 
two or three IPs absolutely bombarding an entire network segment, usually the guard net because, you know, their space, right? Yes. So how can we as the services help you help us at the IEP to stop that stuff? So to um, we need engagement on that. I agree 100%. I, to answer your, directly answer your question, I don't know. Other than we need to get together and we need to figure it out because as Joint Force Co Headquarters Doden has gone on their uh, anti-scanning mi scanning mission, that they've been knocking out a bunch of that. Yes. Um, uh, they have got, we have been able to manage to knock out a lot of the noise, but now we're getting into the types of scanning that you're talking about and how to effectively address that. Absolutely. We're open for ideas, discussion, and moving forward. Outstanding. I got a guy. So, but, but I, would go ahead. I, would, I would say this. The, there's, there is a process in place, right? Just understand that DISA's mission is to operate the IEP. We don't direct change to the IEP, but that process is work through JFHQ Doden to say, hey, we've got, we believe, a service-wide issue, and maybe it's, if it's multiple services, that's when JFHQ Doden is going to step in and say, hey, we probably need to make a global change or have that discussion, which is how we got to some of the things we've been doing, you know, as of late. So, so I would, there is a process in place, but it involves, it really involves Doden, probably in concert with talking with, with this as the engineers on, the, on that side, but it's, it's really... Doden has that process in place for us to, to drive that, that direction down. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. And la la last question, honest. Uh, so <clears throat> with, with the, the wonderful kindergarten classroom that is the GRSS. So, um, <laughs> oh, God. That <laughs> well, who's the teacher around. that we need to talk to when little Timmy's monopolizing <laughs> all the toys? That's the Joint Operations Board. Yes, that's where that's supposed to happen. Um, and it's supposed to be prepped in the uh, DCO working group yep, DCO is where that's tag. DCO tag. That the, the tag where mm -hmm. Stephanie's the mom. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, the, the, her, her technical peer, uh, we are trying to get back to be able to be uh, in her battle buddy back in there. Unfortunately, he, he's been doing, doing zero trust. Uh, and that is that his he's he will be coming back to us hopefully in the next 30 days. Zero Excellent. trust the arch architecture, not zero trust. We don't yeah, trust yeah, it. I'm, tra <laughs> I'm, tra I'm tracking. <laughs> yeah. I'm tracking. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, it was we we lost a lot of traction with some of our problems we've been having with uh, the another agency service component uh, on some of the tools. So it's trying to get some of that dialed back in sooner than later is okay. my real challenge. Okay. We can take that on. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. And, and Mr. Paul? Yes. The Army is, w or w we, you're welcome for your DDoS protection. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, you guys have been a great audience. I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the questions that you had. By all means, uh, come up uh, afterwards if you want to talk to us. We will be uh, standing up here in the front. Um, but thank you very much and hope you enjoy the rest of your AFCEA uh, here in Baltimore.